Dr. Vijwadia, thank you so much for joining us today to talk about sleep. Delighted to be here. I'm excited to understand why you pursued further your practice into sleep. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, sleep is something that's been fascinating to me for many years. As a pulmonologist, we deal with a lot of breathing-related uh, disorders. And a lot of the disorders that affect sleep actually affect the respiratory system. So that was a natural segue into that. Um, we spend a third of our lives in sleep, and sleep disorders impact so much of our life and health. So it was something that I felt drawn to, and uh, it's really gratifying to be able to be in a field where you can make such a big difference. Tell me about some of the sleep disorders that exist um, that create having an issue of sleeping at night. Sure. Uh, most of the sleep disorders that we see fall into sort of three categories. One would be patients that are excessively sleepy during the day. The others are patients that have difficulty either staying asleep or starting to sleep. It's called insomnia. And then the last group of fascinating disorders are those that affect behaviors at night. So abnormal behaviors like sleepwalking, for example. So there's a wide variety of sleep disorders. Um, and uh, we obviously become experts at all of these over a period of training for about a year or two after fellowship. Excellent. What is one of the most common sleep disorders you see? So one of the most common sleep disorders is obstructive sleep apnea. Um, it is a disorder where the upper airway becomes unstable as we set, tend to fall asleep. It starts out with the airway relaxing and vibrating, creating the noise called snoring. Um, and then it progresses from there into further collapse where the patient is not getting enough oxygen into their lungs and therefore their blood oxygen levels fall, their sleep gets disrupted, and they can get extremely fatigued and tired during the day as a consequence of this and it affects their health in, in very significant ways. So who is the type of person that when they're seeing their primary care physician or internist that may refer a patient to you? What is kind of the makeup of somebody who might have obstructive sleep apnea? The uh, most common way that patients present to us is those that are just feeling poorly rested during the day. They're fatigued, they're tired, and they can't figure out why. Oftentimes these patients are snoring at night and that combination of snoring as well as daytime fatigue raises a suspicion for possible sleep apnea. If somebody also now gasps or chokes in their sleep or stops breathing, then really the suspicion for sleep apnea becomes quite high. So there's some misconceptions out there that people that are overweight, have a thick neck, and our men are really the only people um, that most likely may have sleep apnea. Can you explain a little bit why maybe that's not quite the case? Absolutely. Sleep apnea um, happens across all ages. Uh, so children can have sleep apnea. You, obviously, it's more common as you start going into middle age, especially as you start gaining weight. But it can occur even in the elderly. And at each stage, it can have very significant impacts. Um, the other misconception is that you have to be overweight uh, to get sleep apnea, and that is not true either. Uh, you can be have a normal body weight and still have very severe sleep apnea, although it is true that the more weight we gain, the risk for sleep apnea does tend to rise in that particular circumstance. So if someone feels that they may have the symptoms that you described, what's the next step in looking to seek treatment for a better night's sleep? Usually if somebody has symptoms of daytime fatigue or sleepiness, snoring, pausing and breathing at night, um, they should probably do some sort of screening questionnaire. Uh, there are many available online. I know that your website, for example, has one that's, uh, that's been validated. But if they truly feel they might have sleep apnea, it's time to see a medical professional, either a primary care physician or a sleep physician, so that they can go further and get tested for the problem. Does everybody who gets tested end up as on a CPAP or are there other treatment options um, out there? Although CPAP is probably one of the most effective treatment options, uh, it is certainly not the only treatment option. And oftentimes I have a discussion with my patient and I try to understand what brought them to our clinic. Sometimes it's excessive snoring and they're young and they're dating, for example, and they may not want a CPAP. In those circumstances, we can give those patients an oral appliance, for example. 
Uh, there are other surgical options available for managing sleep apnea. There's even an implantable device that moves the tongue forward every time the patient breathes. So although CPAP, again, although CPAP is so effective, there are several other treatment options that can be explored. Excellent. And how quickly do you think in today's world someone can go from wondering if they have sleep apnea to being diagnosed and actually having treatment started? In the past, the journey from diagnosis to therapy was long and expensive. You had to go into a sleep center, you'd get diagnosed, go back to the doctor, go back to the sleep center to get CPAP titration. Uh, nowadays, the patient can accomplish all of this in the home. They can have a telehealth consultation. They can have a home sleep test mailed to them, followed by an auto CPAP machine, for example, that is sent to their home and self-adjusts its pressure to manage their sleep apnea. So many of the barriers that existed in the past have uh, reduced significantly. I should mention that when we talk about treatment, uh, weight management is often a very significant part of the treatment and lifestyle changes, including weight loss, as well as sleeping on one side, for example, might be quite uh, important interventions for patients, especially with mild sleep apnea or some snoring. One last question for you. I'm sure you've had patients come back after starting CPAP therapy. Can you give us maybe one or two um, scenarios that you remember of somebody really benefiting after receiving treatment? Oh, I can think of so many. Um, <laughs> CPAP uh, treatment can be life-changing in patients who have significant uh, uh, symptoms. So there are people who don't even realize how sleepy they are during the day. And when they go on CPAP, it's almost like getting a new lease on life. So they feel much more energized, they feel alert, and their sleep deepens. Um, many of my patients are really happy that they can get back into the bed with their spouse for example sure because so many couples sleep separately because of the loud snoring and maybe disrupted sleep so i've had many patients come back um, and they're just thrilled to be able to say that hey, i'm back in the bedroom with my wife um, so there are some really significant and happy stories that my patients come back with which is again one of the reasons why i just love practicing sleep medicine that's great news. Well, thank you so much for taking the time with me today. I'm going to press you to come back and maybe dive a little bit more into further topics like home sleep testing and, and polysomnograms and some of the other things out there that a lot of us don't necessarily understand. Would you be willing to come back? Lisa, I'd love to. And thank you so much for the opportunity. Th thank you as well. For more information on sleep therapy and similar topics, visit us at CPAPSupplyUSA.com or on our YouTube channel, CPAP Supply USA.